Good afternoon to you all. Uh, I would like to welcome you to this uh, uh, webinar organized by Africa Program of Chatham House on Policy for Recovery in Africa, Capital Markets and Debt Management. As we know, despite Africa having one of the lowest uh, nominal debt levels internationally, the COVID-19 pandemic has contributed to pushing this debt to unsustainable levels. African countries spend roughly a quarter of their budget revenues to pay for that debt service at a significant cost to spending on health and welfare and other very important social obligations that are particularly acute during a pandemic. Levels of capital migration across the continent are also at a whole time high. Uh, and we have uh, now facing uh, also uh, this uh, very important equation of debt versus uh, economic recovery. The difficulties associated with the fact that Africa does not have the policy and fiscal space to do some of the measures that other countries can afford. So we have a very interesting uh, webinar prepared to discuss this topic. I'm very uh, pleased to welcome uh, the governor of Bank of Ghana, uh, Dr. Ernest Addison, that is going to give us a keynote address and uh, is going to be very generous with his time since he's going to stay with us beyond uh, the keynote address that uh, he will deliver. And then we'll have a panel that is going to follow his keynote, a panel of uh, specialists in this area coming with different angles and uh, insights. We'll have uh, Ayodele Odesula, which is the UNDP uh, resident representative in South Africa, former chief economist for Africa for UNDP. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, Ferishka uh, Barut, uh, who is uh, uh, also a very important uh, uh, person in this discussion because she's an economist at the Standard Bank Group, uh, which, uh, as we know, is very uh, much versed into uh, dealing with the analysis in this subject. We'll have Mary Wangari Oamai, uh, Group Executive Director of Equity Bank from uh, from Kenya, but now also a Pan-African institution. We'll have uh, Samuel Sule, who is the acting CEO of Nigeria and head of the financing group Africa for Renaissance Capital that has been doing very innovative analysis uh, on risk uh, associated with the continent. And finally, our last panelist is going to be Shwan Badiru Gafari, Secretary General of the Paris Club uh, in the French Treasury. Uh, a very important uh, player in this debate uh, and was very active during the last two years because of the G20 initiative and uh, a number of other very important discussions regarding that. Um, I am going to uh, basically expect that uh, all the panelists are going to stick to time. Um, we'll have uh, three blocks. Uh, first, we'll start with the keynote, then we'll have uh, the presentations by the panelists, followed by an interactive discussion that I will uh, animate, and then eventually we'll open uh, the floor to all of you, the public. Actually, not all of you, those who are on Facebook Live, unfortunately, at this time, we have to apologize. It will not be possible for you to participate directly. But those who are uh, actually in Zoom, they can, they can do so. Uh, they can already choose their language between English and French. Uh, we have simultaneous interpretation throughout. Uh, participants may use the interpretation function. Uh, it's normally in the Zoom control bar. Uh, you can find it in the bottom of the screen and you can then select your language. All attendees will be muted during the presentations uh, to uh, have a better sound quality but we'll be able to use the raise hand function during the Q&A session uh, in order to ask a question live. Uh, we'll have to select a few and we apologize if we cannot uh, give the floor to all that may uh, wish to, to use it. 
If uh, selected, you will be granted uh, by the Africa program team uh, the ability to unmute yourself and then you know we'll be able to, to ask your questions. Um, the Zoom participants may also submit uh, written questions through the Q&A box throughout the presentations. And even if they intend to uh, participate live with a question, it's always nice uh, if you can write it as well. So in case we have to assemble some of the questions uh, because of lack of time, you know, you, you will not be completely out of uh, the possibility of interacting. Unfortunately, we are unable to take questions, as I said, on Facebook Live. Uh, I want also to alert everybody that this is an on the record uh, meeting. Uh, although it's chat and house, you know, people normally have a bit of a confusion. This is not the chat and house rules that uh, are going to be applied, but rather an on the record. And obviously, you are most welcome to uh, share or uh, comment on this. Uh, webinar and we just uh, would like to suggest that if you do so use the hashtag uh, ch africa which is chat and house africa program um, and uh, you know we'll be able to uh, uh, be uh, able to see all the comments uh, so without further ado i would like really to invite uh, warmly uh, dr ernest addison Governor of the Bank of Ghana to give uh, to give us his uh, keynote address. You have the floor, sir. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is an indeed an honor to join you today. And let me especially thank Alex Vines and the team at Chatham House for the warm welcome to deliver the keynote address. This important forum being held in partnership with the United Nations Development Program as part of the Policy for Recovery in Africa series is timely and will help the discourse in the COVID-19 recovery, achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals and the African Union's Agenda 2063. Today's event, which comes off under the theme Policy Recovery in Africa, Capital markets and debt management will consider issues on multilateral and bilateral initiatives for debt cancellation, debt relief, and debt restructuring, and related issues of capital migration and high risk premium associated with sovereign debt crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all aware of the devastating consequences of the pandemic on the global economy in 2020. Presently, economies have reopened with the support of mass vaccinations, but the recovery remains uncertain with significant risks to the outlook. The recent emergence of the new variant of the virus is a case in point, indicating the fragility of the global recovery efforts from the pandemic. Across Africa, the COVID-19 pandemic halted the growth momentum achieved through years of sound economic management policies and several structural reforms, improved institutional frameworks and infrastructural development. According to the African Development Bank, in 2020, the African economy contracted by a record 2.1%, making it the continent's worst economic recession in over 50 years. The devastating impact of the pandemic on economies in Africa has virtually wiped off gains made towards poverty reduction over the past two decades, with dire consequences for the vulnerable groups, such as women who are mostly low-skilled and self-employed in the large informal sectors. These groups were adversely impacted due to their work in the contact-intensive sectors with fewer opportunities to socially distance and work from home. Overall, the pandemic has severely threatened the objective of inclusive growth on the continent. Similar to policies pursued in advanced economies, several countries in Africa implemented expansionary fiscal policies, accommodative monetary policies, and some macro prudential relief measures to moderate the impact of the pandemic, as well as ease liquidity conditions in financial markets to boost growth. 
These policy measures, coupled with the removal of restrictions and continued vaccination efforts, despite the slower start due to the lack of vaccines, have provided some growth impetus for African economies. The forecasts indicate that Africa will return to an estimated growth of 3.4% in 2021. Even as tourism resumes, commodity prices hold firm, all supported by the accommodative fiscal and monetary policy stance. For African central banks, a major key concern is that the policy space, which allowed for the pursuit of accommodative monetary policies, introduced at the onset of the pandemic seemed to be diminishing with the emergence of macroeconomic imbalances intensified by the lingering impact of the pandemic. The mix of rising global inflationary pressures, tightening of global financing conditions, rising commodity prices, rising long-term bond yields in advanced economies, threatening of the US dollar, and widening sovereign spread in some vulnerable frontier economies and volatility in capital flows are beginning to exert pressures on African economies. Headline and core measures of inflation have risen across several African countries. For some, fiscal deficit have surged to new historical highs, further increasing debt sustainability risks. Lack of fiscal space and rising debt issues even before the pandemic has been amplified by the inevitable COVID-19 related increased spending activities. Ladies and gentlemen, the outlook for Africa's debt sustainability is challenged by emerging risks and vulnerabilities. In 2020, the data showed that some eight African countries had to pay about 10% of the value of their total debt in debt service payments, while others owed about a third of their debt to private creditors. As of December 2020, some six countries were in debt distress, 14 were at a high risk of debt distress, 16 had a moderate risk of debt distress, while two were at low risk. As credit rating down rates occur for many countries in the medium term, higher spreads and limited access to international capital markets remain a risk in the outlook. Faced with these debt challenges, the World Bank and the IMF prompted the G20 countries to establish the debt service suspension initiatives to suspend debt service payments to the bilateral lenders of 76 poor countries around the world. In this way, countries could channel resources to support the pandemic-related issues of saving, safeguarding lives and livelihoods. This initiative provided some relief and freed up some 5 billion US dollars in relief to more than 40 eligible countries. The suspension period has been extended to December 2021. Unfortunately, several African countries that were classified as serious teams of their distress could not access the initiative because they were classified as middle income. In addition, the G20 initiative excluded debt from private sector creditors, multilateral banks, or Chinese commercial banks. Therefore, the IMF provided new loans during the pandemic to support such middle income countries. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, with sovereign spreads widening in some African countries due largely to investor sentiments and the sustainability of the current fiscal stance, given the herd mentality of investors this remains a matter of concern. African policy credibility is being put to the test severely. The issue is that the current international framework has an efficient way of dealing with the developments as they occur, given the current need for jobs for the youth, jobs for women, and also the need to create jobs and political constraints associated with, with growth. There is a view that these issues facing many of our countries are more of a short-term liquidity issue which can be resolved over a period of three years if the appropriate liquidity management instruments could be created. Ladies and gentlemen, addressing these multiple goals 
obviously will be challenging and will require a difficult balancing act to the trade-offs associated with policy options. In conclusion, let me note that there are no easy solutions. And I believe that the deliberations this afternoon will provide some clarity on the optimum policy choices as we all deal with the debt headwinds that Africa faces at this moment. I wish all panelists in this session and all participants very fruitful deliberations on these important issues. I thank you for watching. Thank you, Governor, for uh, the clarity of your presentation. We really enjoyed uh, the fact that you listed all the challenges, but also you provided some of the way forward uh, solutions that we should consider. I'm now going to start with the panel, uh, but before I do so, let me just remind everybody that you can access the bios of the participants in the chat box uh, if you are in Zoom. Um, otherwise, you know, you can also access them through the website of the Chatham House Africa program. We uh, are going to start uh, with uh, Ayadole Odesula. Um, and it, there is one reason also I wanted to start with him is because he's from UNDP. And UNDP is a co-sponsor of this series of uh, webinars with the Chatham House. So in one way, he's also representing institutionally the the partner that we have for uh, this very interesting uh, collection of discussions that we are going to pursue still further. So uh, without further ado, uh, Ayodole, you have, the, you have the floor. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, the program director. I think it's, it's really great that the governor has really set the pace for us to really launch on. Uh, I just want to, mine will be very, very uh, strict and uh, directed to what we need to do differently on the basis of the issue of uh, debilitating debts within the continent. First, I, I just want to let us underscore the fact that uh, one, we need to really find a way of making effective use of dormant and sleeping capitals, or uh, what I call uh, ineffectively utilized capital that are in Africa. That's one thing. And because of that, we focus too much attention on things that are from outside. Uh, based on the, 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 the kind of estimate we have, I know based on the, the, the kind of discussion, uh, Africa has uh, an external need for about 890 billion, of which 290 billion was considered to be the gap, the financing gap. But we strongly believe what we have within African economy is quite huge. Particularly, the recent estimate from UNDP side showed that we have $1.1 trillion uh, that are either dormant or not effectively utilized in the form of uh, the foreign uh, foreign exchange reserves, in terms of uh, the IDO uh, bank uh, reserves, in terms of insurance, pension fund, and the sovereign wealth fund. Altogether, 1.1 trillion, which is really huge, but we've not been able to effectively utilize all this. That's one of the angles which I think we need to effectively reflect on. Now, when it comes to the issue of uh, key policy actions, the kind of reforms that we need to put in place in terms of managing debt in a way that would be extremely sustainable. I would say the first one is for us to also focus attention on greater transparency and disclosure, because that has been one of the major, major things that is really bothering many countries. We are all living witness of uh, what happened in Sri Lanka. Uh, as well as the latest one in Uganda in terms of possibility of seizing in Tebe uh, International Airport because of loan default. Now, it shows that uh, we need to really pay more attention to the issue of uh, public uh, debt, uh, debt disclosure, which I think is really very important. And I strongly believe that uh, it could be part of the indicators the rating agencies need to be taken into account because it's really going to show some kind of deterrent to those that are really forcing some countries and not to disclose. Second, and I think it's really very important for government to ensure that this becomes a major standard or indicator of approving new loans or refinancing. Uh, public disclosure too, we need to really change some of the requirements that uh, the uh, security and exchange commissions across countries are now using as part of it. So this is something that I think it's really very important and it doesn't leave the IMF behind. IMF also need to probably 
expose, I mean, spread the good practices on the issue of public disclosure in the financial, uh, uh, financial sector assessment, which I think is really very important. And uh, I just so, also think the need for us to fully, fully involve the private sector in the consultation process is very important. Uh, the DSI that the governor mentioned uh, is one thing, but the fact that uh, the private sector was not fully involved right from the beginning, and they see it as a fait accompli. We think, given the diversity of uh, debt in Africa, there is need for them to be fully involved in this process. And also, the one, one size fits all idea doesn't work. We need to really look at the sentiment of the various actors, which is really very important for us. And in this regard, I want to say it would be good for us to really see how can Africa maximize the issue of collective uh, action clauses for its own development? We need to really see how we galvanize action on this so that it's not only for secured bonds alone, but we can use it for non-secured bond and other initiatives. So these are things which I consider to be very important in terms of taking this initiative forward. Uh, but uh, Program Director, I just want to underscore the fact that uh, the need for us to really, really promote what they call equitable burden sharing remains critical because we need to, it shouldn't be Africa, that would be paying most of the brands, but both the creditors need to find a way of mechanism of sharing part of the burden, which becomes quite critical. But finally, finally, program director, I just want to underscore the fact that uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, state contingent financing framework, we all need to look at our state-owned enterprises very, I mean, very well. We need to make sure there is strong reform agenda for them to even be able to access any loan. Otherwise, these things will be going into the drain pipe. So the public enterprises in all African countries needs to be well restructured to be able to meet the challenges of transparent and accountable use of public resources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ayodele. You were putting the emphasis on the homework that we need to do, the things that we need to do inside our own countries to, to, to be able to tackle this issue comprehensively. Thank you. Farishka, uh, Barut, it's now your turn. Please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Program Director. So from my side, debt sustainability concerns has definitely been a contributing factor to the unfavorable risk premiums associated with African debt. And, you know, these concerns have been rife in many African economies, even before the onset of the pandemic. But the pandemic has certainly added to debt burdens across the continent. And it has also revealed fiscal and external vulnerabilities that, you know, in the past were probably concealed by consistently high growth rates. Um, but there are definitely a handful of markets now which you know i would regard as somewhat fragile and this would include ghana zambia kenya ethiopia and angola and you know they're watching or monitoring their recovery from this crisis would be something that um i would keep you know at the forefront of um my analysis going forward um and you know why I mention these markets is that in some instances, if it weren't for the World Bank's debt service suspension initiative and other debt reprofiling initiatives that were undertaken last year, we'd be having a completely different conversation about some of these credits. But you know, now looking forward um, with the DSSI falling away in December and the IMF's new SDR allocations, this does definitely provide an additional buffer as we go into a period where external financing and refinancing costs for African sovereigns would um, likely increase. And yes, it would increase because of you know, global changes in the monetary policy environment, but also it would relate to lagging fiscal consolidation efforts in Africa and the general uneven nature of the recovery. But as I was saying, if you look or if you if you notice the conditions um, of 2020 or leading up to 2020, you'd know that Africa Africa's sovereign's balance sheets didn't you know reach 2020 in the best shape, and this is because many of these countries spent the better part of two decades trying to close the infrastructure deficit. 
And, you know, what's more concerning in Africa's context, given its development needs, is that external debt stock since, 20, since 2010 or so has become less concessional and more commercial. And this has definitely contributed to, um, you know, those persistent debt sustainability concerns that we saw. Um, and, you know, with a larger concentration of commercial debt, it's definitely harder to cancel, restructure, renegotiate, and even negotiate widespread debt relief without there being a definite market impact, which, you know, would include changing the sovereign's credit rating and limiting um, the sovereign's access to international credit uh, capital markets. Um, but, you know, if you look at Africa's investment needs, particularly for key infrastructure, they remain the same, they remain vast. And if you, you know, consider that in context of domestic savings pool, domestic saving pools are really small in comparison to Africa's development needs. So, you know, as we've seen in the past, uh, governments would be inclined to borrow and contract debt to advance these investment ambitions. And, you know, even if debt's probably going to cost more and come at a higher cost, I believe that um, governments would still contract uh, debts at higher, at higher rates to advance these am ambitions. And for me, then, you know, the quality of the investments going forward is likely to be quite important. Something that, you know, in the last 20 years, when Africa was amassing debt was not necessarily in focus. And perhaps a greater focus and a better understanding of the return of investment could actually um, bode well for improving debt sustainability on the continent, because it would add to our understanding of how these investments would translate into a higher productive capacity of the economy and, you know, we would be in a better position to adjust spending to improve the quality of spending. And, you know, over time, I believe that this would contribute to actually even reducing the unfavorable risk premiums that we have continued to struggle with as a continent. So thank you. I will leave it there and hand back to you, Mr. Program Director. No, thank you very much. You know, you are you are raising a couple of very important points relating to the real uh, capital needs uh, for development and how the current structures available are not responding to this major structural issue. And uh, as a result, you know, we're just trying to always patchwork uh, our way through, but we, we are not addressing the structural issue. Mary Wangari Wamai, it's your turn. Please, you have the floor. All right, thank you, uh, Chair of the session, and thank you to the previous uh, speakers for the very insightful uh, comments. I think I, I would like to take a different perspective or rather from a private um, a sector financial services player in the East African and Central African region. And based on our experiences, I think at the end of the day, what we need to ask ourselves is, what problem are we trying to resolve eventually? What, what is the, the, the issue? And I think from my perspective, the issue is the economic crisis that has hit our, our citizens, uh, our customers, uh, which have been caused by uh, the direct and the indirect uh, impact of uh, the COVID pandemic. And we are talking about uh, very high unemployment. We are talking about uh, high poverty levels because of loss of jobs, which have further uh, caused higher inequality. Um, it has caused also uh, low household um, uh, incomes. It has caused a uh, rising corporate uh, failures and uh, redundancies um, in the in the job in the job uh, market and all that. So I think for me that that is uh, the issue from the from the financial institution side. What has happened is that um, the, the, because of the crisis, they are elevated NPLs, and uh, of course there is then the the, um, the the fear of lending anymore. 
to an already um, credit starved market. If you look at the private sector lending, the levels have really gone down in the last um, one year. And this did not start with COVID. I think COVID just made it very, very uh, serious and very severe. Now, if, if we approach it from the point of view that we can take in initiatives that are going uh, to support um, the economic activities and that will support businesses, uh, the small and medium enterprises, uh, businesses, the, the large enterprises and then the smaller corporates uh, in the various sectors. And as equity, we have identified um, the sectors that can be really um, impacted very quickly. We have identified sectors like the health sector, as we did with the pandemic. We have identified the, the agriculture sector. We have identified manufacturing. Um, e-commerce, because now we are all going e-commerce and, and COVID has really fast-tracked that, and the digitization uh, initiatives, and, and of course the issue of financial inclusion. It almost feels like we are almost going back to where we started, where we really had to really tackle the issue of how many people are banked uh, among the, and the, the bankable population, because uh, COVID has really taken us back many steps. And uh, from my perspective, I think if we have uh, strong initiatives to support financial inclusion programs uh, and also programs like financial literacy, I feel that uh, what would happen is then we have uh, more small businesses um, becoming sustainable and getting larger and uh, the, the individuals are able to save more. We have more savings available in the market. And then what happens is that then there's more money flowing to support the domestic markets. The, the government can actually borrow more from the domestic market and, um, and, and, and there'll be less, less control or rather there'll be better control of the cost of that credit. And what will also happen is that if there are more savings, then there's also more money available for lending to either the same businesses in uh, different sectors or to the, to the government through pension funds and um, other, other savings um, uh, vehicles. I, I, I do think that a lot of money can be mobilized in that way. I think one other thing that the policymakers can, can, can think about um, uh, the access to capital markets is uh, if I take the case of Kenya, for instance, uh, there's a time that um, the capital markets had actually introduced a counter which was dedicated to the small and medium enterprises. And that was um, a while back, just to encourage small and medium enterprises to access the capital markets, go listing on the stock exchange, the Nairobi Stock Exchange, uh, get access to funding easily. But for some reason, that counter has not really caught on for some reason. So I think we need to find out why exactly are the small and medium enterprises not able to access that counter? Is it that we have put very severe uh, requirements for them? Uh, probably we have put the same requirements like we do for the larger corporates or the multinational or global businesses to list on the stock market. And they, they, they are finding it very difficult. Actually, it's a barrier to enter into that se sector. And that would be a good vehicle for, for businesses to to raise money um, and then that to ease uh, the, the requirement for the government support and all that. So I think from my perspective that that's a, one other thing we can think about. And I think I also like um, the comment that was made by the previous speaker who said that we have the capacity to mobilize more cash within the continent. And the one way of looking at it is uh, diaspora remittances, for instance. We look at the, the vehicles that are open for the, the customers in the diaspora to bring money back uh, for small investments 
in their local markets, even as they work abroad and live abroad, that, that's another way. And we know that um, in the region, we have been able to mobilize quite uh, some huge amounts of money through diaspora remittances, but the logistically it still remains a challenge. Uh, but now we are looking at uh, digital platforms. So I think digitization can also help in terms of uh, creating incentives, making it really easy for, for, for those customers to send money back into their respective countries. We, we believe that there's a lot of money that is available uh, through that, um, that, that uh, vehicle. So that, that's what I would like to say for now, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, but I think at the end of the day, we have also not um, really seen the full potential of our local banking institutions, of our regional and African regional institutions, like uh, the African Development Bank, we have the, um, the, the PTA Bank, we have the Afriexim Bank. I think we need to pay attention to those um, institutions so that they can also be vehicles for, for change. We have uh, worked a lot as a bank with, um, for instance, the African Development Bank in terms of uh, credit uh, risk sharing guarantees, which gives banks a uh, more appetite for lending uh, to businesses as they recover. And the, here we are talking about either new money uh, or top ups for old loans an extension of moratoriums uh, to businesses. And that is making a lot of differences, especially when we also say that um, we will give preferential terms to women enterprises and the youth enterprises, a focus also on um, other services like um, uh, financial literacy, entrepreneurship training, so that as the businesses recover, they are able to get back on their feet and the owners and managers are well equipped to, 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 to build better and more sustainable businesses. So in my own view, I think there are so many ways of looking at this um, issue. Um, and I think uh, if the governments are able to give the proper tax incentives, a proper, the proper moratoriums here and there, waivers here and there, especially on tax issues uh, so that they can give incentives to the players in the private um, sector, they can be able to do a lot more uh, than they're able to do within the current uh, constrained environment. Uh, those are my comments, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, thank you, Mary. I like uh, the fact that you brought us even more homework, but this time more focused on the issues relating to uh, how we, we need to perfect our instruments and particularly your points about the small and medium enterprises and the diaspora are very well taken. I think these are important possibilities that are not uh, handled with the care and with the attention that they deserve. One in terms of access for uh, capital and the other in terms of how to disperse properly. Uh, now let me turn to Samuel. Samuel, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I'll start by saying that Africa doesn't have a nominal debt problem. I think there are other problems, uh, some of which are structural, such as capital formation. And capital formation could be both internal as well as external. Who prints the currency that we utilize in terms of trade? And, and, and that's very clear. But what I'll try and do is I'll try and set the context from a commercial standpoint. Because when you look at the multilateral debt, has been said on this call by some of the panelists, it's a bit unclear as to what is within uh, the forms of, of that debt, uh, that debt class. But from a private private debt standpoint, private commercial debt standpoint, where does Africa as a continent, and it's a very diverse continent, stand? It's $163 billion, uh, and just around half of that is, is done by the four major economies on, on, on the continent. Interestingly enough, just above half of that, again, has been issued since 2019. Shows that the largest need has happened in the last few years, and if you were to look at that versus where we are, from, from a global standpoint, you've seen within that time, there's been a, a fall in commodity prices, as well as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, most of it is in dollars, about 85%, and most of it is bought by large institutional investors, mostly sitting in US and, and Europe. I think some of this point to some of the structural points that we've tried, we've tried to uh, discuss on, on, on this panel, and, and, and there are questions that have to be asked and perhaps some of our leaders need, need, need to do some determinations from that. But if you were to put this in an overall global context, 
the last decade or the last two decades have been has been a decade of global debt. Uh, Africa is just basically playing a part that many other uh, sovereigns have done, whether it be uh, the global sovereigns, uh, the US, the UK, uh, across Asia, across LATAM. I think African leaders have said there is a need to fast track development. They've seen what other parts of the world have done. And, and, and they've essentially done the same. Now, there are certain issues in what they've done, and perhaps these are what the problems are. Number one is revenue, and revenue is linked to use of proceeds. O over time, the economies have still remained rather bureaucratic, uh, and it means that the revenue drives have not increased. We've seen increased digitization across many economies, but many of this has not been able to translate into real revenues for government to spend. I think when we go back to debt, there is a little problem with what, what we see from a debt standpoint, and that is the use of proceeds. The use of proceeds has typically been for budgetary purposes, and everyone knows that that creates a lot, a lot of flexibility to use for either roads or salaries or other recur non recurrent uh, other recurrent expenditures uh, like wages, and, and, and that can lead to a bloated workforce. And, and other, all, all others have used it for infrastructure, but infrastructure differs from one side to the other. If you're building a railway, it takes you five, six, seven years, and perhaps the revenues from railways don't uh, increase, uh, increase over, over a decade. And we've seen many African governments do that. So we, I, I do think that, that there are use of proceeds issues that perhaps are internal, but there are still overarching structural issues around capital formation. Number two is cost. The cost of an African sovereign coming to market is extremely high compared to Asia, compared to LATAM, compared to economies with similar GDPs, populations, uh, structural structures. It is very, very different. We're seeing anything between 500 and as high as 800 basis points, and each basis point is very material. And that cost is partly related to a narrative. That narrative is Africa being the last frontier, the final frontier. The final frontier might mean that people are willing to go into it, but it also means that perhaps it's not been, uh, be, been, been addressed for a reason. That narrative continues to change as we discuss these issues in a more open way. And part of that, the narrative leads to the increase in the cost of risk. So as we say, what do we do with the sum of African debt that is existent at this point in time? Many of those conversations go beyond uh, do we address it by addressing revenues or do we look to restructure or is there a default? Now in having that conversation, it's very good to be frank and for us uh, as, as, a global, as a global economy and as Africans uh, to look at this, but it does increase the, the, the cost of risk. Any site around restructuring or default or, or the need for anything in that climb leads to higher risk premium. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a cycle that needs to be broken but from a nominal debt, debt standpoint, uh, I think that th that is not the issue. There are issues around capital formation. In terms of revenue, that's the very important. In terms of exports, whether within the country, continent or outside of the continent, that still needs to be addressed. And, and we have certain reports around gross external debt as a percentage of merchandisable exports. And for many African countries, it's gone two, three, four times uh, over, over, over the last decade. Uh, it is a narrative issue, and, and that narrative continues to change with, with foreigners such as this. And, and fundamentally, there is a use of proceeds uh, question or, 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 or issue that, that needs to be uh, further, further highlighted. I think that is, that is it from my side, and, and I'll hand over back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, I really liked uh, the way you framed it, uh, capital formation and and costs uh, should be the angle we look into the debt issue. Uh, it's not an African problem, sovereign debt. It's a it's a global issue, <laughs> rather than an Africa problem. And you know, Africa may have specific uh, uh, contextual uh, challenges to address, but it's a global issue. And now I'm going to turn to Shwan. You have the floor, Shwan Badiru Kafari. Merci beaucoup, euh, Monsieur le Président. Merci, Merci à tous pour l'invitation. Euh, donc, je vais m'exprimer en, en français si ça, si cela convient à tous. Euh, problème. Donc... Merci beaucoup. Donc, en tant que secrétaire général du Club de Paris, je vais essayer d'apporter une approche un, un peu différente qui est celle 
en réalité des créanciers, euh, des créanciers euh, bilatéraux officiels euh, et notamment euh, d'essayer d'expliquer le rôle que peut jouer un, un un, un, un groupe comme le Club de Paris, qui est un groupe informel de 22 créanciers officiels bilatéraux, pour apporter des solutions euh, aux pays qui feraient face à un, à un problème d'endettement, que ce soit d'ailleurs un problème de liquidité ou un problème de, de soutenabilité. Et, et, et de ce point de vue, je vais essayer de rappeler des grandes tendances euh, qui sont celles de l'évolution de l'endettement en Afrique ces, ces dernières années, à, afin d'expliquer ou mettre en perspective les initiatives qui ont été lancées l'année dernière euh, en, en conjointement avec le G20 pour justement apporter une solution dans le contexte de la crise Covid aux au problèmes d'endettement auxquels euh, notamment les pays africains euh, faisaient face. Le premier point que je voulais rappeler en termes de tendance sur la, la question de l'endettement en Afrique subsaharienne, c'est euh, malheureusement une accroissement, un accroissement des risques de surendettement. On le voit notamment quand on suit les analyses de soutenabilité de la dette du FMI et de la Banque mondiale, qui, mont qui montrent que depuis, depuis cet été, il n'y a plus en réalité de pays en Afrique subsaharienne qui soient estimés en risque faible de, de surendettement. Donc on, voit un, on a vu un accroissement de, de, des risques de surendettement, notamment depuis l'initiative PPTE, pays pauvres très endettés, qui avait permis de rétablir ou de contribuer à rétablir la soutenabilité de la dette de, de plusieurs pays. Mais depuis lors, on a vu plutôt un accroissement de l'endettement, euh, puisque le, le taux d'endettement de ratio de dette sur PIB est passé de 22% en, 2000, en 2012 à, à 36% en, en 2019. Et donc déjà dans ce contexte d'accroissement des vulnérabilités, on a eu bien sûr le choc de la crise du Covid-19 du COVID qui s'est ajouté à cela et qui a contribué à un nouvel euh, euh, accroissement de ces vulnérabilités avec notamment un ratio de dette sur PIB qui est passé à 54% au début de l'année 2021. Ce contexte s'est aussi euh, 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 déroulé dans un, dans, un, dans un contexte de diversification des sources d'endettement, avec notamment une plus grande part des créanciers privés, qui explique aussi l'importance effectivement des créanciers privés mentionnés par les principaux euh, panélistes, et aussi des créanciers non membres du Club de Paris, en particulier la Chine, qui a vu son poids s'accroître considérablement dans le, dans le, le stock de dette des pays, euh, des pays africains. Un point également que je voudrais, que je voudrais souligner, c'est la diversité quand même des situations des pays africains, puisqu'on a des pays, par exemple la Zambie, qui a, qui a en défaut vis-à-vis des créanciers obligataires, on a des pays qui justement euh, ont, permis, ont développé un accès au marché et dans des très bonnes conditions, y compris pendant, pendant la crise, enfin depuis novembre 2020. Donc, il est important de rappeler la diversité des, des, des situations. Mais donc, dans ce contexte d'accroissement des vulnérabilités, le Club de Paris, euh, en coordination avec le G20, a lancé des initiatives l'année dernière pour apporter euh, une solution aux pays qui feraient face à des problèmes, problèmes d'endettement. Tout d'abord avec l'initiative de suspension du service de la dette, qui a été lancée en, en, en avril 2020, qui visait à suspendre le service de la dette pendant la crise, afin de permettre aux pays de consacrer des ressources plutôt à la réponse à la crise, plutôt que de, de rembourser le, leur service de la dette. Ça, ça a permis d'avoir un impact non, non négligeable, puisque environ 50 pays ont pu en, en bénéficier pour un montant de, de près de 13 milliards de dollars depuis mai 2020. Et cela concerne, en ce qui concerne au moins le Club de Paris, 25 pays africains pour un montant cumulé de près de 2 milliards de, 2 milliards de dollars. Donc ça a eu quand même un réel effet. Euh, qui, a permis, euh, qui a permis de soutenir les pays pendant la crise. C'est aussi un, un, un enjeu important de coordination entre créanciers officiels bilatéraux, puisque, comme je l'indiquais, cette diversification euh, des créanciers officiels bilatéraux des pays africains, avec un point important des créanciers normes du Club de Paris, posait la question de comment apporter une solution le jour où il y a une difficulté. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle, de nouveau en coordination avec le G20, le Club de Paris a agréé ce qu'on appelle un cadre commun, le Command Framework, qui vise à apporter des solutions aux pays qui feraient face à des difficultés d'endettement. De, Encore une fois, que ce soit des, des difficultés juste de liquidité, c'est-à-dire un pays qui aurait une dette soutenable, mais un besoin de liquidité à, à court terme, ou les pays qui auraient une dette qui, soit, qui serait devenue insoutenable. Et ça, euh, encore une fois, c'est euh, le Common Framework qui a été agréé. Trois pays aujourd'hui ont fait une demande au titre de ce, de ce cadre commun, euh, le Tchad, l'Éthiopie et la Zambie. Des progrès sont réalisés dans, dans la mise en œuvre de ce cadre commun, en particulier pour le, pour le Tchad, puisque un, créa, un comité de créancier a été formé, des assurances de financement ont été, ont été données, et cela a été un vrai levier pour aider le pays dans ses discussions avec son, ses créanciers privés, 
ces créanciers privés, puisque, euh, comme vous le savez, le, le, le premier créancier externe du Tchad est un créancier privé. Et, et le FMI, je crois, a, a, a communiqué récemment sur le fait que ces créanciers privés s'étaient aussi engagés dans un processus, dans un processus de, de restructuration. Donc, de ce point de vue, on voit que le coin framework est, est en train d'être mis en place. Il y a une courbe, bien sûr, d'apprentissage pour des créanciers qui ne sont pas membres du club de Paris et qui n'avaient pas forcément l'habitude de participer à des discussions multilatérales en matière, en matière de dette. Il y a clairement une courbe d'apprentissage, mais euh, des progrès significatifs sont en train d'être réalisés, en particulier dans le, cas de, dans, le cas du, dans le cas du Tchad. Je finirai par un seul point, qui est la question de la transparence, qui a été aussi mentionnée par d'autres panélistes, qui est un point très important. On, 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 on partage l'objectif d'améliorer, de renforcer la transparence sur le stock de dette des pays, aussi bien d'ailleurs de la part des créanciers euh, officiels, euh, officiels bilatéraux. À, ce, à cet égard, le Club de Paris publie tous les ans le stock de ses créances vis-à-vis -vis de l'ensemble des pays, mais aussi des créanciers privés. De ce point de vue, on soutient les initiatives qui sont lancées notamment par l'IIF d'améliorer la transparence des, des, dettes, des dettes dues aux créanciers privés. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shwan. I, I think you, you brought the angle that we were expecting from the Paris Club, particularly this debate about the DSSI and how effective or not it has been. Uh, I, I'm sure that in, in the dialogue that we are going to have, uh, this issue will come, come back to hunt you because you were rather optimistic in your view of the, of the outcomes. Now, uh, I think uh, with, the, with the presentations uh, that we have uh, had so far, uh, we can easily uh, say that the angles that were the most important in this debate have been covered. Uh, starting with uh, Samuel and his uh, statement that you know the main issue is how we um, can uh, figure uh, the problem of access to capital and how uh, we have uh, penalized Africa one way or another uh, in this access. I still remember that RENCAP, your uh, organization, uh, did um, uh, an estimate of... Uh, the growth patterns in Africa just before the pandemic, I think it was after the IMF published its uh, forecast in January 2020, where you, you realize that uh, the majority of the population of the continent was going to be living uh, in countries with 5% growth or more. So this was about 21 countries, but you know, counting the population, that was the prognosis. And then, you know, the pandemic came and everything changed, forecast and everything that we could have expected. Uh, and, and the realization that the, the, the kind of answer that we provided uh, to uh, the pandemic crisis in so far as Africa is concerned was more uh, repeating the same recipes rather than you know, looking into how much the external dimensions of the crisis were affecting some of the structural problems of the continent. My question to you, Samuel, is how you think we can change this narrative that is penalizing the continent so much? I think it's, it's multi-pronged. How do you change a culture? It's, 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 a, it's a very difficult thing and it's a multi-decade, uh, multi call it a century's worth of exercise. Uh, see, I, I, I think the more case studies and the more examples that we have, uh, is, is important. I think you started to see a lot of African, both private and public sector, start to form capital within, uh, within the confines of the continent. And many of these have been quite supportive, even on, on, on recent borrowings by, by, by the sovereigns. Uh, I, I th we think that a reliance on, 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 on just foreign capital, which has been the case for the last decade or two, does not work. And at the end of the day, the returns have to have to come back, and 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 the returns of every investment is spent in the country where it's returned to, and and once that is taken into heart, uh, that works. But in terms of changing the culture and changing that narrative, I think every step works. Uh, panels such as this are quite helpful, making sure that there are few case studies that can be shown, and and there've been case studies on the political side. There've been case studies with regard to specific projects. I mean, Ghana with electricity is one. Ghana has too much electricity, one would argue. Uh, however, th there has to be case studies with regards to uh, how do you grow revenues in a sustainable way? How do you 
increased beneficiation from from a uh, raw materials perspective? Uh, how how do you make sure employment remains stable? Uh, how how do we make sure markets remain stable enough uh, for people to want to invest, not just from a number standpoint, but from a, a stability of, of of investment standpoint? And and I think each step is day as, every day as it comes. Uh, and we just hope that the leaders are also aligned with with with, with this prognosis. So Samuel, you are insisting that you know we have to also look into the possibilities of creating uh, capital, generating capital domestically in the in the countries themselves. A point that Ayodele has also emphasized, and uh, a point that in a way Ayodele was pushing to to the governor, although that was not direct. But he was saying, you know, some of the monies that are used by the central banks in terms of, you know, how they keep their reserves are not being used in a, in a sustainable way uh, and are not contributing to creating possibilities for increasing access to capital. So let me turn to the governor and see what he has to say about that. Governor, you have the, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much again for that question. Uh, I think that we have had uh, those types of, you know, criticism in, in the way in which we invest our central bank reserves, especially because the central banks uh, tend to focus more on preservation of, of our resources, and therefore we are less ambitious in terms of the instruments in which the, the reserves are managed. We try to ensure that these are placed with triple uh, A, you know, institutions that can ensure that you know these reserves are protected and stable. And and that for for me, I think that is an important part of the macro frameworks that we find in Africa, because the, the level of reserves also, in a sense, uh, strengthens our ability in terms of our monetary policy and being able to keep our currency stable. So in a world in which the central bank does not have stable and strong reserves, your monetary policy would may not be as effective as, as it should be. And another dimension which I think uh, we need to put on the table, this notion that there are domestic resources which are not being utilized. If you take Ghana, for example, we have a very vibrant uh, local currency bond market, uh, which is opened up to non-resident investors. The same players that you see on the international capital markets are buying some of these uh, local government bonds in Ghana. Nearly 20% of local government bonds have been local uh, central bank government, central bank and government bonds are invested in by non-residents. And, and therefore, we are in a sense, you know, mobilizing a lot of resources domestically also uh, using these local bond markets. And, and I think that if you look at the Ghanaian banking system, for example, our banks are overexposed. Almost all the domestic resources, which is available in our banks are being held in, in government paper. Nearly 80% of, of portfolios of banks being held in, in government paper. So this is really uh, the issue. I agree with the panelists who suggested that the investment requirements are huge. And, and really, this is the, the big problem that, that we are facing. So we are doing our best in terms of trying to uh, develop local markets that can help to mobilize the savings. Thank you, Governor. I want to bring Mary into, into this discussion. Mary, you were uh, very much emphatic that, you know, the way we are dealing with the diaspora is not uh, uh, the best. We could mobilize uh, more and probably we could use that capital more productively. Uh, partly, uh, uh, the, the, you, you are providing uh, uh, two, two, two answers to, to the discussion that we're just having. One is that you know if we look into stability uh, as a factor, as the governor was just emphasizing, diaspora uh, remittances have proven to be one of the most resilient. Uh, uh, so they, they provide a lot of stability. So how can we make sure that we 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 sort of uh, a, a put put more uh, enthusiasm 
in changing the policy environment and the ecosystem that deals with remittances uh, in order to, to, to create that stability. And the second, uh, you were also referring to the fact that a lot of the difficulties that the banks, the commercial banks in particular face are somehow related to uh, the regulatory environment. Like for instance, the, 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 the type of uh, requirements for the SMEs uh, are, are just impossible to meet. Uh, and so things that are relatively uh, not easy, but relatively uh, possible for governments to, to do faster than probably, you know, trying to mobilize other sources of capital that, you know, will satisfy the big players rather than the SMEs that are the ones that create the jobs. Mary? Thank you. And thank you for that. I think um, um, one of the participants Hill there has also raised the same issue. And I probably I would like to comment on that, especially in terms of uh, the, the SME uh, aspect of it. But, but, but I think um, what we have seen is that um, the diaspora flow is, um, is, as you have observed, a very reliable uh, source of uh, you know, money flows back into the countries, the various countries that it's like coming to stay because uh, from our experience that money is used mostly in two different ways. And the first one is to support families back home. And uh, that probably would also help in starting small businesses and sustainable small investments for the family members back home. And the second one is uh, for investments and savings for the person who is sending the money back home. So those are the two major items that we have identified. So what probably we need to be thinking about uh, is, uh, is there a possibility or also of having a diaspora fund or a diaspora bond or you know, some very specific instruments that work for that community because there's always a logistical challenge in them bringing the money back home. Uh, so, but, but of course it's becoming easier now we have uh, some digital platforms that are able to, to, to allow us to send the money back. But uh, when you look at it from the point of view of the diaspora resident, it is very, very difficult for them because having sight of uh, their investments back home, it's not usually very easy because usually they will send the money to the bank and then the bank will have to figure out, okay, what does this customer want to do with this money? Some of them send it to their relatives and that's done. When they want investments, how do they go to the stock exchange, for instance? How do they go to, how do they invest in bonds? There are no particular instruments for them to invest directly uh, from the diaspora. So, so those are the, some of the logistical challenges that we have seen that, that are uh, an issue. And, and, and I think something can be done. But uh, just to say that uh, we've seen huge increase in that um, remittance. And uh, I think just by doing a little bit more on the logistical and administrative uh, side, mm -hmm. uh, we can also consider whether we need to look at the, the taxes on this um, money that comes in because right now the money comes in and there are taxes to be paid, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, so those are the issues that we have to look uh, at. We, we also talked about the capital markets and its friendliness to, to especially the SMEs. Now, if typically you go to the stock exchange and I'll give the example of equity, you are required to show, for instance, uh, so many years uh, positive financial performance. You are supposed to have a minimum of 1,000 uh, shareholders to start with. And, and the question is, if I'm just a small business uh, that has started out and uh, I am basically a family owned business, um, how do I get 1,000 shareholders to show to the capital markets authority for them to allow me to list? So some of these are requirements that don't specifically apply to the nature and the structure of SMEs as we know them. And that is why it is important to look at those barriers and say that if you are a small and medium enterprises, we have different rules for you. We'll relax the rules for you. 
you can go to the stock market, you can raise money, we can allow you to either do an IPO or do a bond or commercial paper or whatever instrument works for you. And then um, you're able to use that money to generate good returns in your business. And at the end of the day, you are able to create more employment you are able to make more returns, you have more money for savings and investments, either with the government or other instruments, or with the banks who are then able to place the money with the bank, with the government in the, the domestic market. So I think there are so many ways of uh, looking at it. Uh, but I think uh, just to go on to the question on the chart on the de-risking of uh, small and medium enterprises, I think uh, we have had a very good experience that. Um, the credit sharing guarantee mechanism is a very good way of de-risking because we've been able to use that facility and the African Development Fund has done that. And we know the UNDP, they are coming up with also some, uh, some uh, uh, instruments that will help the banks to de-risk the customers so that they can get access to, to, to credit even in the face of uh, the very tough environment where the businesses have not been doing very well, but the banks will have more, 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 more faith uh, that the money will be paid back because someone is covering them. I think uh, we've also had some very innovative products uh, like this a project, a product we are doing with um, the, 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 the MasterCard Foundation, we call it Young Africa Works. And the aim of that is to create 5 million jobs within, uh, I think it's either three years or five years. And already we are past the targets and we started that program just before the onset of uh, COVID. But of course, what happened is that when COVID hit, the efforts were fast tracked because of the circumstances that were prevailing in the market. And we have seen very, very successful progress because uh, young people are able to start small businesses. They are trained on how to become good managers. And we are seeing those businesses starting now to blossom, employ more people, create employment, and start contributing to the, to the tax um, and, and, and all that income in the country. So there, there are many initiatives that we can think about, even local solutions, even as we think about the very global uh, top level uh, solutions that really alleviate the circumstances on the ground. Because I think at the end of the day, all the solutions we are discussing should be directed to that citizen, the one who really needs to make ends meet every day uh, by having some income generating uh, activities on the ground. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, th thank you, Mary. I'm going to go back to the governor because you, you're mentioning some of the opportunities that uh, a very well organized uh, diaspora bond or equivalent type of instruments could provide. So governor, I I'm sure this is something that you are already considering or already have in place. Well, yes. I mean, the idea of diaspora bonds have been around for a while. Uh, it's something that we tried in Ghana sometime in, I believe, 2007. For some reason, that particular diaspora bond was not too successful. But I do know that there are a lot of you know, Ghanaians in the diaspora who are active participants in our local bond market. The arrangements are there for the remittances uh, that come in, which are directed uh, that local government bonds, uh, the banks have the primary dealership with the banks that deal with those types of resources. So mm -hmm. the financial arrangements are there for Ghanaians in the diaspora to be able to invest in local government bonds. At the same time, we, we also have uh, some of the other remittances that are coming in to meet the household uh, demand issues. No, thank, perhaps, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Samuel, you wanted to add something? Well, no, no, I'll say perhaps I may, and, and I have worked on a diaspora bond in, in the past. Here are the there's fundamental issues around diaspora remit remittances and, and the diaspora. The persons on the continent are much wealthier than the persons in the diaspora, and, and that is a factual thing. So the capital formation, formation. onshore, even though it's not enough, 
is much higher. So diaspora remittances are really around uh, uh, around uh, basic necessities. And, and the things you can solve for are costs by making sure that the value that's transferred from uh, outside the continent into the continent comes at comes in almost totality, as opposed to what we've seen with 5, 10, 15% with some of the providers. And then you can make it more easy. And, and that's by using tech. However, there are certain issues around KYC and some of the softer issues that still need to be addressed. Uh, that said, the, the second thing I would say is that the most successful diaspora program in the world is from Israel. It is a savings product and it is tax deductible from US taxes. And that is only, that is only when you start to create, create uh, products such as that, do people think, okay, fine, I can use this and I can then transfer funds. I basically save on my taxes here. So there's a benefit at the same time, I'm developing my continent or my country, and 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 then it, it's it's fully supported. So there are a few structural parts that still need to be ticked for us to get there. But at this point in time, what can we solve for? We can solve for costs, and we can solve for for, for the technical or the ease part of things. Yeah, uh, the point that you are raising, Samuel, uh, actually uh, is very important for us uh, to see it from a different perspective. Uh, Normally, people associate ODA as the sort of the main contributor for development. And you know, this is, you know, a complete uh, distortion of reality. Uh, now we are moving into uh, a focus on diaspora and uh, remittances because it's much more than ODA. And what you are saying is that be careful because that it can be yet an important contribution, but a distraction in relation to the real McCoy. Uh, which is, you know, how you mobilize the resources internally, which is a point that uh, Ayodele started by mentioning in his introduction. So I wanted to go back to you, Ayodele. You, you have mentioned the, the pension funds, which have a lot of money in Africa. They are not used uh, productively in most cases. Can, can you offer us a further comment on that? Ayodele? Yes, th thank you. Thank you very much. I think... Uh, the, the issue is very, very, very important in terms of uh, making effective use of pension funds in most uh, African countries, particularly in South Africa, Nigeria, and, uh, and the like, where you have the largest concentration of the pension fund. Uh, the, the first thing is that some of these countries have some kind of regulatory controls in terms of the proportion that can be used internally. And that's one thing probably based on the, the historical antecedents where the account, accountability on the use of such resources have not been quite uh, robust. But I strongly believe on the basis of what we have now, there is need for us to really see how we build the institutional capacity of pension fund so that we can effectively utilize them domestically. And uh, what we need to do is just to make sure the diversity of the use of pension fund in local economy is well entrenched. Uh, but the institutional guidelines that needs to be done and then effective monitoring of the use of such funds becomes critical. So those are the kind of things which I think is really very important. And uh, like I said, pension fund is quite huge. And uh, we're talking about 300 billion that we have. And uh, those that are making effective use of it, the, the, the highest it may be in terms of spending just about 40% of it internally. In fact, in some countries, just less than 10% of it is spent internally. And uh, perhaps one of the feedback we got from some of the countries is that, oh, the same international agencies that say, OK, invest your pension fund in stable economy, uh, indirectly discouraging uh, some of the, I mean, the stab I mean, investing such funds in Africa. So we strongly believe this is a major source of capital that we can effectively utilize to run our economy. And that the need to put in place is to probably entrench institutions, quality institutions, to ensure that such resources are effectively deployed and also effectively utilized in terms of using it to turn around investment and development opportunities that we can use to drive growth on the African continent. So it's really very important. Uh, we need to do that. But I also want to really underscore some of the things that will help us to really galvanize economic growth that will generate revenue in so many ways. And if you look at uh, the, uh, the, the ease of doing business in Africa, only two countries are below 50. So, uh, I mean, the best, among the best 50 in the world, Rwanda, Mauritius, and Rwanda, number 13 and number 38. 
but we cannot promote a, what we call a, a kind of growth and foreign investment in an economy that is not really, really solid in terms of uh, business competitive environment. Getting electricity, getting credits, getting uh, uh, what you call construction permits and registering business. These are things we need to really see how best we do uh, in terms of uh, facilitating uh, effective utilization of those resources. Because if the environment is not conducive, there may be the tendency to make effective use of them, particularly for small scale enterprises may be quite challenging. No, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Ilde Rapp, uh, he has made a couple of uh, interesting comments in the chat box uh, to actually uh, uh, ask the question directly and direct it to one of the panelists. Uh, if uh, the, the team can help me just give the floor to Hilda Rapp. Uh, I apologize, I wrote these things as I was listening, so I cannot actually quite remember what I have uh, written. Uh, and uh, also many of my questions I think have been answered by participants in one way or another. Um, what I'm really concerned about is to look at the bigger picture, you know, that currently we are focusing particularly also on, on uh, resilience in Africa against climate change and other shocks and risks. And there are a lot of finance mechanisms being set up to, to deal with that, many of which would be equally applicable, I think, to any other kind of business uh, uh, decision making uh, and, and institution. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered whether if we can think big uh, and include also the assets that Africa has in terms of um, climate capital, you know, um, the carbon sinks, which are not carbon priced, which are not made available, but not monetized. There will be a lot that can be done if those two genders get joined up. Uh, and also Africa has already a culture, for instance, of uh, creating circular economy mechanisms, uh, which means huge amounts of, in, of, of um, work opportunities can be created by simply going with that agenda. Uh, so it's more question of, of joining up just even the programs within Chatham House that, that are speaking to the various challenges that I think Africa faces. Uh, and that was really basically the nub of the question. Uh, no, that, that thank, you. No, thank, thank you very much. I think uh, I, wa I want to address uh, your question indirectly uh, by, by just uh, uh, giving you uh, an indication that there is a number of publications being done on, on that very issue in the uh, African Climate Foundation website. So um, I would uh, really like for you to, to consult it. But let me ask uh, Schwan to react to uh, the, the bigger picture issue that you are raising. Schwan, uh, do you think there is any appetite in the discussions that you, you organize in the Paris Club for some of these more uh, important opportunities related to uh, climate, uh, for instance, the carbon markets and the, the, the opportunities that exist in Africa to be also considered in the way risk is assessed. Uh, what, what do you think is the behavior of uh, your uh, bilateral uh, members in relation to the changing climate of the finance uh, world because of climate change? Mm. Merci beaucoup pour la pour la question. Euh, effectivement, le, le je pense que l'idée de euh, d'une certaine manière réduire le service de la dette des pays pour les aider à financer euh, notamment la lutte contre le changement climatique euh, ou, ou l'adaptation au changement climatique est quelque chose. Enfin, c'est un instrument en tout cas que au sein du club de Paris on a pu utiliser par le passé. On a dans nos accords euh, régulièrement des clauses euh, sur des euh, mécanismes de conversion de dette, dette swap, euh, qui peuvent être mobilisés pour fournir des efforts, on va dire, supplémentaires à ceux qui sont nécessaires pour établir la sociétéité de la dette. Et, euh, et, et là, ça permet d'avoir un dialogue entre le créancier et le débiteur sur justement la, la manière d'utiliser ces, ces ressources dégagées. Et il est clair que dans le, dans le contexte actuel, <coughs> il est de financer des mesures pas seulement de lutte contre la pauvreté, comme c'était le cas dans l'initiative PPTE, mais aussi euh, de lutte contre le changement climatique ou l'adaptation, est quelque chose qui, à mon avis, euh, peut être regardé par les, par les créanciers officiels bilatéraux. 
Euh, ensuite, je pense que le point important, c'est euh, d'avoir en tête que ce type de mécanisme n'est pas forcément adapté à toutes les situations, à tous les pays. Euh, euh, c'est plutôt adapté pour les pays qui ont un problème, on va dire, éventuellement de liquidité, plutôt que problème de soutenabilité, et qui ont besoin de dégager des ressources euh, pour financer des dépenses qui, de toute façon, vont être financés pour, pour, pour s'adapter au changement climatique ou lutter contre le changement climatique. Donc, en, en, en résumé, je pense que c'est un mécanisme qui peut intéresser des créanciers officiels bilatéraux dans certaines conditions assez, assez particulières. Et dernier point, il y, a, il y aura quand même toujours un sujet, on va dire, d'une certaine manière de coordination. Comme je l'ai indiqué précédemment, des créanciers non membres du Club de Paris sont devenus les, créanciers, les premiers créanciers de beaucoup de pays africains. Pour ces pays-là, j'avoue que je ne sais pas bien dans quelle mesure ce type de mécanisme est quelque chose qui peut les, qui peut les intéresser. Euh, en tout cas, si ça devait se faire, je pense que ça devrait que ça se fasse en coordination entre créanciers du Club de Paris et créanciers euh, du G20, comme on, on a pu le voir avec les initiatives, les initiatives euh, lancées l'année dernière, parce que c'est ce qui permettra d'avoir un impact beaucoup plus, beaucoup plus fort euh, pour, pour aider les pays euh, à faire face au changement climatique. Merci beaucoup, c'était très informatif. Je veux donner la parole à David. David Kemvin, uh, to, to ask his question uh, that I want to direct, by the way, to Ferishka. So Ferishka, just be attentive to the question that uh, David is going to ask. Uh, you, you have the floor, David. Uh, the question that uh, I had was that uh, Action for Southern Africa produced a report called The Money Drain quite recently, and it identified three areas of debt that African countries face, odious debt, illegal debt, and immoral debt. And I just wondered what can be done to uh, deal with uh, these particular issues and how we can help to alleviate the debt burden from them on African countries. Thank you, David. Uh, Farishka, if you can answer this, uh, this question on behalf of the panel with your personal insights. Thank you, David. So using my personal insights, um, I would say that, you know, transparency and governance is key here to actually not contracting this debt in the first place. So, you know, the debt you refer to as illegal, immoral, or even, um, you know, debt that really shouldn't have been contracted anyway. Um, you know, if you, you know, go back to the Mozambican experience that we've had, um, we've seen that that debt has been classified as illegal, but, you know, just removing it from the debt burden itself has complexities. So it's not necessarily something that is easily done. And that's why I would recommend that we try to deal with this before it's actually included into the debt burden. And, you know, um, even in Zambia's case, um, there was a lot of chatter that um, the debt numbers that were reported initially, or, or the official debt numbers, were not the debt numbers, and there was hidden or illegal debt that, um, you know, is to be reported. Uh, but, you know, that hasn't materialized, and I think, you know, um, the fact that these rumors or this chatter actually starts speaks to the credibility deficit that's, that's there and exists because of the lack of, or because of the weak governance uh, and um, governance and actually trans, uh, per, um, the governance controls in place. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, if, if I may, uh, you know, just keep you, Farishka, I, I... I was uh, trying to save a question for you myself, uh, but I wanted to give a chance for uh, those uh, in the audience that want to raise questions. We have those two, if there are more, please uh, come forward. We are about to close uh, the session soon. But I wanted to ask you, Farishka, what do you think of Shivan's optimism in relation to the DSSI results? Because, you know, $2 billion as, uh, you know, uh, the, the outcome of such a very complex initiative, uh, $2 billion for Africa. Do you think this is anything significant? So 
I think it is. Um, you know, in my opening comments, I alluded to the DSSI being an integral force in actually, you know, preserving creditworthiness last year. And, you know, when it was extended to this year, it was a welcome relief for many of these issues that are still recovering from the shocks related to COVID. What I have my reservations about is, okay, um, the G20's common framework beyond, um, beyond uh, the DSSI. And here I believe, you know, I understand the concept of it and I believe that it could help to bring, you know, debt burdens back to a sustainable path and could help sovereigns, you know, when they make that trade-off between servicing debt and, uh, and growth in the near term. But I believe that, you know, participation is, oh, but I believe that, you know, the market reaction to participation might dissuade further participation. So you'd recall that, you know, when um, Ethiopia earlier this year announced that it would participate in this um, framework, you'd recall the market uh, reaction that followed and, you know, the persistent uncertainty related to their involvement in this um, framework. So, you know, um, perhaps once we get a better understanding of how this framework is applied and applied in Chad, we'd have some sort of reference when it is applied in Ethiopia and then, you know, later in Zambia as well, when that debt restructuring um, occurs. Thank you very much. That was a very good compliment to uh, your initial thoughts on it and uh, Siobhan's intervention. We are about to close, uh, but I wanted to give uh, one more word to the governor. Uh, after listening to all uh, this uh, discussion, I'm sure you, 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 you'd feel like me that we could have had an opportunity to cover more about the SDRs, that it was important for us to look into the issue of uh, sovereign credit ratings uh, as uh, two elements of the discussion right now that are occupying a lot of our minds and that have not yet found uh, a very clear path forward. And I know Ghana has been uh, particularly vocal in these two fronts. So if you could just uh, give us some closing remarks referring to these two elements of the discussion that were not properly covered. The, the SDR allocations to Africa and how we are going to use them and uh, also the sovereign credit ratings uh, uh, the, the debate. Well, thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, I think that those are very important questions. As you're aware, many African countries benefited from the SDR allocations were done. It allowed us to have access to liquidity to deal with the impact of the COVID-19 you know, pandemic, especially the issues of debt. And, and the discussion that the lady just had with us on the benefits of the DSSI, I think she was spot on on why many countries were not able uh, to apply to participate in the DSSI because of the concerns about the market's reaction to countries that apply for DSSI. And the risk also associated with not having access, you know, to the capital markets. Again, if you apply for DSSI, you would note that many of our countries spend the last 10 years undertaking, you know, a lot of reforms to be able to, you know, get onto the capital market and, and issue bonds. And any decision that more or less would close that access uh, would have to be taken, you know, with a, a lot of caution. And this is why I believe uh, not many countries have taken advantage of, of the DSSI. There are still ongoing discussions on reallocation of SDRs uh, from countries that do not need them to those that appear to need them. We are still uh, waiting for the IMF to give us more clarity on, on that issue. And as I said again, for, for us, we think that this is really uh, a shock. Uh, the pandemic really is the source of 
debt sustainability problem that most of our countries are facing. And if we are able to find that liquidity liability management program to tie us over this uh, two or three years of tightness in the market, we believe that the debt, debt, debt levels would eventually become sustainable. And therefore, some arrangement that brings in temporary liquidity uh, would always be important in resolving the situation in which we are. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Right on time, I want on behalf of the Chatham House Africa program, thank you all uh, for participating, the panelists. Uh, you have been uh, excellent uh, in keeping time and also your insights were very much uh, well received. Frischka, Schwan, uh, Ayodele, Samuel, and uh, Mary. And I want to particularly uh, thank the governor for his availability throughout the webinar. Um, I hope that for all, all the participants uh, from the public, this was as useful as it was for me. And I think that we have an excellent opportunity to continue this discussion in other fora. Thank you very much. <laughs>